start recording. Okay, we are going. So, I have one piece of news to announce, um, thanks to some people who sent me this information because I did not know. It turns out that almost as if they wanted to support Handmade Hero directly, Microsoft decided yesterday to announce that they were releasing the professional version of their IDE for free for small teams. And if you are practicing it at home by yourself, you are sort of the definition of a small team. And what that means is you do not have to use the Visual Studio Express version. You can actually use something they call the Community Edition. Now, I tried downloading it and it is installing in the background here, but as far as I can tell, it actually is just the regular Visual Studio 2013. Um, and that is pretty awesome because that means that for the whole series proper starting Monday, assuming that this works, um, I will be able to use the exact same version of Visual Studio as people who want to follow at home, which I think is awesome. And you may wonder why I didn't just use Visual Studio Express. And the reason for that is at least in previous versions of Visual Studio Express, there were some things you couldn't do, like view the registers uh, in the register window and stuff like that. Just a couple things that I wanted that were really gonna help me to explain a couple things. And so I'm really hoping that this pans out. We'll see, I'll play around with it a little bit uh, tonight and tomorrow and we'll see, and hopefully this will work out and then we can all be on the same package. So I'm pretty excited about that. And uh, hopefully that means you can totally ignore what I said yesterday about installing Visual Studio Express. You can actually go on and, and get this. And if you want to get it, um, it was really easy to find actually. They, I guess it's sort of an initiative they have, but it's just visualstudio.com. Um, <clears throat> and this is right here, free developer tools. So you can go on there and you can get that and you just download it and install it. And it didn't even require the little uh, me creating an account thing that they had required before. Now I don't know if it will after it's done installing, but it didn't, it didn't require that for download. So that's pretty awesome. All right, I'm gonna have to learn John Blow's mic discipline where he mutes whenever he drinks. But for now, you're gonna have to actually listen to the drinking. I apologize for that. I, I just don't have those skills yet. Um, that comes with being a professional caster. By Monday, I will, I will have it. All right, let's pick up where we left off. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna open up Visual Studio again. And uh, I have my Visual Studio uh, set largely because of this project, I, I switched it to this. I have mine set in the options. Uh, there's a thing called startup uh, under environment. And what it says here at startup, you can pick what you want to have happen. I set it to load last loaded solution. And remember the solution is the thing over here that holds all the projects that you want to build uh, in a particular go. So I set it to that so that when I open it up, we'll be right back where we left off. And here you are, this is the code that we saw yesterday. And if you remember from yesterday, basically what we learned was <clears throat> that these things are called functions. They have returns, which are things they provide back to the people who call them. This is a call. Uh, they have parameters, which are things they take uh, that are passed in. And then they have a body, which has stuff in it. And we haven't really learned how to put anything in it other than just how to call functions. That's it. And we also learned some of the Windows minutia, the fact that this is the entry point where Windows starts your program. And this is uh, basically something that takes the contents of a file and dumps it into your file so that you can import things that other people have written or things that you've written yourself in a way that you find more convenient. So that's what we did last time, but we still have a lot to cover here because we haven't really gotten into the meat of how you write C code and we haven't gotten to the, into the meat of how to really write Windows code. So, uh, and I guess I probably will save a lot of the Windows stuff for Monday, but I want you to at least see some of the, some of the things that, that we're gonna talk about. All right, so in this particular uh, program as we stand now, we sort of left off where we were calling this output debug string A function. And when I ran the program, which you can do by hitting F5, or you can go in here to the, uh, to the build start debugging, um, it printed something out to the debug. Console and this was a Windows function that did that. We have no idea how it works. We did not implement it um, I just simply told you that if you call it it will work But there's a little piece at the end of it that we didn't cover uh, unless you stayed for the Q&A last time and that is that a is Is sort of appended to the name of the function and output debug string makes some sense, but what does the a mean? well the answer to this which uh, I will I will kind of go into a little more detail now is that 
Back in the day, uh, Windows only worked with standard ASCII strings. And I'm going to show you what a standard ASCII string actually is. And now some people were suggesting um, in the Q&A yesterday that A actually stands for ANSI, uh, as far as the Windows nomenclature is concerned. And they may actually be correct. ANSI and ASCII are basically uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, ASCII is, is the earlier version, I believe. Uh, but you can see if I actually search, oh, you know what? I'm not going to use Firefox. We've been using Chrome. Let's, let's stick with one web browser. So if you search for ASCII, and it's spelled A-S-C-I-I, if you search for that on the, on the uh, internet, you will get something that looks like this. And it's basically a description of a way to encode the letters that you would normally use in a Roman alphabet uh, in order to, you know, in a way that you can represent them with numbers. And so here's a little, you know, primitive ASCII chart that someone has made and attached to the Wikipedia page. Uh, and basically uh, what these things show you is they show you how numbers correspond to letters. It's a standard scheme uh, that shows you how that works. And that's not a particularly easy to read ASCII table, so I'm going to try and look for an easier one to read here. This one looks pretty good. So here you go. You can see here it says ASCII value on one of them. And I don't know if I can blow this up a little bit. Let's, let's see. Can I make it any bigger? Wow. That's some browser science for you right there. I don't even know what just happened. Uh, let's see. There we go. That's what we're looking for. OK. So if you take a look at this table, you can now see uh, that it's got a number, a bunch of numbers down the side, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And as it goes, they're all corresponding to, at these early numbers, some fairly esoteric stuff, like the backspace key, um, you know, things that, that probably like the escape key. But as you get up into the higher numbers, you can see they start to translate into things that you would actually type, like a space, like parentheses, the numbers, uh, there's the letters here, and then the lowercase letters. And basically all this is, is it's a way of saying, well, in a computer, the only thing we can really deal with is numbers. And you'll kind of see that as we go through this series, everything is always numbers. And you basically always have to boil everything down to numbers. And so early on, uh, they had to figure out a way to represent human readable text because that's something computers want to work with all the time. They had to figure out how to represent that using numbers. So they did the logical thing, which was to start laying out what is almost a cipher, if you will, a way of translating numbers to letters. So I am going to do something in the debugger now that lets you see uh, how this actually works. And it will uncover a lot of stuff that I'm going to teach you over the course of the next hour. And so it's a pretty good introduction. And when we are done with it all, uh, you will finally see why the A has to be there, because I will tie it back in to why there's an A instead of just making it look like that, which is what we tried to do originally. And if you remember, just to, as a refresher, if we compile it like that, we were getting an error. Uh, the error was cannot convert parameter 1 uh, from const care to lpcw stir. And we don't have any idea what that means yet. So we will at the end of this episode. So I am going to do something, the first thing, in fact, that we have done in the whole series, that involves the debugger the actual debugger. We were running our code in the debugger. And what that actually means is that instead of loading it as an executable the way Windows would normally load it, we're actually sort of loading our code to run it under sort of the auspices of a tool that is designed to help us find problems with it. And that is the debugger that's built into Visual Studio. That is why I am hitting start debugging to start debugging um, instead of saying something like run. And what this allows us to do is when we run things under the debugger, instead of our, our code just running willy-nilly and doing whatever it's going to do, it allows us to inspect how the program runs and watch how it works so that we can figure out what it's doing wrong. Since you can imagine once you get into fairly complicated scenarios, it could be pretty difficult to figure out what's happening in a complex program. And all you see when you try to run it is that it doesn't work. Well, you need more information than that. So what I'm going to do is set something called a breakpoint. And what a breakpoint is, is it's something that says, I want you to run the program until you hit this line of code. And when you hit this line of code, I want you to stop. And I want you to freeze the state of the program, all of its memory, all of the registers, the CPU state, everything about the program. I want it to freeze so I can look at it. Milk hit. Okay. 
The way you do that is by hitting F9, and it, it sets a breakpoint wherever the, the, the caret is, the, like the um, actual thing that you would type. Uh, or you can click kind of over here. You can see I can I put these things. And it puts a little red orb next to a line that has a breakpoint on it. That is one way of setting a breakpoint, and it's a way we'll use for now. We'll learn some other ways to set breakpoints in the future. If I now do F5 to start debugging, you will note that, well, okay, you won't note anything until I put the A back in, because of course, we'll still get that error, okay. Once I remove that error and we start running the program, you will note that there's a little yellow arrow. I don't know if you can see that on the stream, but a little yellow arrow that comes up over the line that says, basically, this is where the program stopped. So it did exactly what I want it to. It went to the line that I set the breakpoint on and it stopped. Now, I am gonna close these windows over here. And the reason that I'm going to close them is because I don't know which of them will come up by default for you. And so I want to show you how to get some of these windows back uh, in case you are sitting there at home trying to follow along and going, where are those windows? So there's a couple ways you get windows in Visual Studio. You can go to view and you can see that there's a bunch of windows that you can open from in here. Uh, but I believe they no longer put the debug windows in there. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that they put them in here. Yes. So there's two places. There's ones that are in here under view and then there's ones that are under debug under windows. And the ones that we're going to concern with while we're debugging are obviously the ones that are in debug. And the one that I want in particular is something called watch. Now what watch is, uh, it, it, there's four of them because, you know, they thought you needed multiple, which you often do, but didn't give you infinite of them. I don't know why there's only four. Someone got the memo that they needed more watch windows, and the only way they could figure out to do it was to make four of them, so there are four of them. But we're just going to open one of them, and now here is our watch window. And what this watch window does is it allows us to type in the name of something that we want to see uh, in here, and the, it will show us what the corresponding value is. So what I'm going to do uh, is I'm just basically going to take this string um, for the moment, so I can show you this is nothing else. I'm going to take this string and paste it in. I'm going to see if it can do this. No, it can't do it. All right, never mind. So I'm going to have to hoist this out with something I didn't quite want to talk about yet, but I will talk about it in one second. I was hoping I could do this without that. It's kind of a, a tricky thing to go in just the right order. All right, so what I've done is I've captured this string out to a variable, and I didn't want to quite talk about those yet, but we'll, we'll talk about them a little later. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what the actual value of this string actually is uh, when you look at it. And some of these things will be confusing to you because this is like several steps in if you want to understand everything that goes on here. Uh, but what I wanted to show you was we can actually inspect the actual values of this string. Now, even though we set our fonts big, I feel like this font is still too tiny. And people were saying that the fonts were too tiny to see. So I'm going to break just one second and see if I can't make that a little bigger as well. Uh, because one of the things that, that people were saying is they had trouble seeing things. So watch windows. Can I set that to the same font that we had uh, before? Masters of alphabetical order, unleash themselves, liberation mono, 11 point. I have to restart the application. No, there it is, it totally worked. Okay, hopefully that's a little bit easier to see. So what I have done is I have asked the watch window in a way that we'll get a little bit more familiar with later to show me what this string looks like when you actually look at it numerically. And you can see here what it's done is it gone through each individual character of the string and it has shown me the actual number that it actually is using. See, 84, 104, 105, 115. And if we go back to the little uh, table there that I had out, and you know I can alt tab between these, 84 is the number we've got here. And you can see 84 corresponds to capital T. And hey, guess what? That is exactly the first letter that we wanted. So these things, these strings, uh, when you define them in C, what it's actually doing, the compiler will take what you have typed inside the quotes and it is actually going to go through and each individual character will be translated into the proper ASCII value that represents that particular character. Now, that's all well and good, but up until the end, we get to, to something right here that's a little wonky, backslash n. 
Now, why is there a backslash n? And you'll note, if I, if I you know, let this program run to completion, when we looked at this line, there was no backslash n in it. So what's going on there? Why don't we see a backslash n? Everything else got printed, uh, but not the backslash n. Well, the reason for that is because backslash n is actually a special code. Uh, and if we go look at uh, the string all the way down to where the backslash n actually occurs, so you can see here we've got printed period, which is the end of it there, but then there's a 10. There's no backslash n. Even in, after the compiler's done with it, it doesn't have a backslash n either. So it's not just the printout that doesn't have our backslash n. What happened here? Well, you can see now that I've, I've told you uh, that these are ASCII key codes. Uh, what you should have been able to do if you wanted to jump the gun at home is you could go look at the table and figure out what that is. So let's go do that. If we go here to 10, you will see that it is right there. Data link escape, which honestly is not what I would have called it. I would have called it carriage return, which is 15, but I guess there's CRLF. Now that, you know what? I'm gonna have to call weird on that now that I think about it. That is not what I would have expected. This is a mystery, ladies and gentlemen. Why has it inserted that character? I have absolutely no idea why it did that. I would have, I would have expected what I was expecting to have happen. I would have expected it to insert this character and this character actually, um, but it did not do that. Instead, it, in, it inserted this, even though it is a backslash n. I am, I am, uh, what's the word? I am, I am thoroughly confused by what it just did. And I'll be honest with you, I have absolutely no idea why it would do that. That does not make sense to me. I'm gonna try, I am actually going to switch temporarily into debugging mode for real so I can see what exactly is going on here. It's been a long time since I've ever actually looked at what happens uh, when you do some of these things. So I am going to check out these codes. So what these allow you to do if you are not confused by them as I just was, is when you insert a backslash in the middle of an actual string, what it does is it takes the next character and it uses it as a special code to output characters that are not easy to type on a keyboard, uh, that don't have a, a direct uh, sort of, what's the word for it? Uh, what's it? Ah! <sighs> that is the problem right there. So, this tripped me up something fierce. I was looking at the octal, okay. Phew, I thought I was gonna have to start the very second stream of this series with like, I have no idea how to program, which would be very unfortunate. But it just turns out this table is, I didn't bother looking at the order. So we have decimal, hexadecimal, and octal. What they've done is they've encoded the numbers in different bases. So let's ignore these right here. Um, I, I guess I was just doing it instinctively correctly, but then when I scrolled over here, I switched to reading the octal column because like, like we said before, we lined up T correctly with 84. I didn't read 124. Ah, yeah, I don't know. So anyway, this table is trying to be helpful by encoding them in different encodings. So this is decimal, which is base 10, the kind that we're normally used to reading, and it's all I really wanted to talk about. We do want to talk about hexal, hexadecimal. We probably won't talk about octal much at all. We'll talk about hexadecimal a little later, uh, but since it came up because I got confused, I will briefly say that it is a simple way of encoding numbers a little more concisely by making it so that it's base 16 instead of base 10. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. You can completely ignore it for now, it was just something that tripped me up because I started looking at octal, which is base eight. And you can see that it goes zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Instead of using the eight, it goes right to 10, right? Base eight. So you don't actually get to count to 10. All right, so to ignore that, thankfully it did what I would have expected, what I thought it was going to do originally, which is insert one line feed. Uh, so if we look at the number here, it's 10. And on 10, it is line feed, which is what I would have expected. Okay, so let me continue to explain what I was going to explain. That was, that was a close one, ladies and gentlemen. I, I, I knew there was gonna be a lot of debugging on this, on, this, on this program, but I was hoping to not have it happen just to insert escape codes. Uh, okay, so anyway, these escape codes are basically there to put things in that we wouldn't be able to type directly. And the reason that we can't type them directly is because what I was trying to do when I originally typed this line is, in fact, you know, I could even give you a quick little demo here. Let's say I was going to output two lines. So I wanted to output this line, this is gonna be line one, and this is going to be line zero, and I want to see these two lines, right? If I were to run that, uh, you could see, well, let's try that again, that was just a build, there we go. If I were to run that, 
you do not actually see line breaks. You just see the word line zero and the word line one, but then it, you know, it stops and there's no line break in between them. And the reason for that is because the debug output actually doesn't assume that the thing that you're outputting is supposed to be its own line. It assumes you might want to put multiple things on the same line that come from different calls to that function. So what it actually does here is it requires us to pass it something that indicates that it should be a new line when we actually want a new line. And so that is what the backslash n is. It just inserts the character that would normally be inserted uh, if you were hit return. Now you may ask, why don't I just hit return, right? Why don't I just put the return in there because I can type return. Well, if I try to build that, you get an error which is new line and constant. And the reason that you get that error is because C actually does not allow you to use a return character in a string. Strings all have to be on one line, or if they're not on you know, one line, they have to be escaped in a, in a special way. And you can't ever actually embed the return character in them. It's just not something that the syntax allows. So what you actually have to do is you actually have to use the code for it. And those are called escape codes. The backslash does it. Now you may ask, how do you print out a backslash? Because I maybe wanted to do something like print out something like this, which is like a line zero slash line one or something like that, right? That's what I want to print out, right? Well, you can see it's actually given me a warning, unrecognized character escape sequence, because what it does anytime it sees the backslash is the compiler tries to read the next character, like I said, to turn that into one of these ASCII characters from the table. And since it cannot do that with L because that is not something that C defined, C does not define backslash L to actually map to any ASCII character, it gives us a warning and says, I don't know what I was supposed to do with that. So when we actually run that, uh, you will notice that it just gets rid of the L, uh, I mean, gets rid of the backslash entirely because it did not know what it should do with it. So if I wanted to put an actual backslash, you just put two backslashes. So you can always actually get a backslash in there if you want to. It's just you have to type two of them because it's going to look at the next one and go, I got to do an escape code. And so two of them is how you tell it, no, really, I wanted a backslash. All right, back to our story. So uh, when we went in here and I was looking at this, I went down to the end of it, and we looked and there was a 10 at the end. And it freaked me out for a minute because when I looked at the table expecting to find nine feet, I did not find it. Uh, but it turns out I was just looking at the wrong column. So happiness. Basically, that is just one of the characters uh, that refers to a new line. And remember what I was saying is I, I said something like I expect you to in insert one of these because I didn't quite remember which was which. This is not something that I ever deal with on a daily basis. Uh, but basically, there's two characters which sort of have to do with advancing lines, if you will. There's 10, uh, which is new line, uh, which is a line feed. And there's 12, which is form feed. Uh, and, uh, and there's also 13, which is carriage return, right? There's all of these. Basically, there's different conventions for how things are formatted. And 13 and 10 are actually used differently by different operating systems. On Windows, the convention is normally that you need a 10 and a 13 to, to actually create a, a new line. One of them goes to the next line and one of them goes back to the beginning of the line. So basically 10, sort of if you're printing out lines, moves you down to the next line but leaves the cursor where it was, if you will. And then 13 actually goes back to the beginning of the line. I believe that is the order that they would actually go in. And so the way that you encode the other one is actually backslash R. Let's run this again. Please run my program. Hello. For some reason, this is not happy. Why have you locked me out of my program? Well, I suppose Visual Studio is going to crash fairly often on us. We might as well get used to it. Jeez, modal dialog is active. I don't know if I believe you that there is a modal dialog active. Does anyone see a modal dialog? I do not. Yes. So basically, since we're in a circumstance where we can't actually uh, rescue uh, Visual Studio for itself, it's time to push yet another thing on the stack, which is what to do if Visual Studio totally freezes or hangs on you. And let me be honest, this will happen to you all the time. It is not a particularly reliable piece of software. I mentioned Control Shift Escape last time to bring up that task manager. Control Shift Escape is your friend. Control Shift Escape allows you to bring up this thing called processes in which you can find when you, uh, when you want to kill something. You can find the name of the thing that's running and force it to shut down, which is exactly what we want to do. So if I go in here and I look, uh, I believe they call it devenv now, yes. Devenv is the name 
of Visual Studio when it starts up. You can see over here, Microsoft Visual Studio 2008. If dev end is misbehaving, you can right click on it and you can click end process tree. And if you do that, it will die, which is exactly what we needed to happen. So then you can just restart it and hopefully you didn't lose much in the way of work. Um, I believe we should be able to open our project and things should be saved and they are, so that's all good. And now I can get back to the lesson, but that is a very good thing to remember. You'll have to do it a lot. Control shift escape brings it up and then you can find dev in here and you just hit end process tree and you can restart it. So that's good. If anything locks up on you, it's a good escape hatch. You don't have to reboot the machine, so that's good. Okay, getting back to what I was saying, escape codes. So escape codes are ways of embedding things into strings that you couldn't normally type. And the only thing that I was trying to say here just for completeness is that both of these two things, uh, the backslash R and the backslash N, are both there uh, to allow you to in encode uh, you know, 13 and 10, which are things that you need for new lines. And the convention is that backslash R, backslash N, which is 1310, uh, that is the convention on Windows for how you end a line. Now the debug output doesn't require it, but for example, if we were going to save these to a text file that you were going to open, it would require these. It's called CRLF sometimes, uh, backslash R backslash N is the way you type it in C, it's 13.10 in ASCII code, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if you were on, for example, Unix systems, you don't put the, the backslash R. The backslash R is actually not required on Unix systems. They use just backslash N to actually do the whole uh, go to the next line and return to the first character. Like you can almost imagine it like a typewriter. So on Windows you did both and on this one you did that. And that is one of the reasons if you've ever loaded a, uh, a file in Notepad in Windows that came from a Unix system, all the line feeds are gone and stuff like this. That's because text files, even though their format is pretty standard, text files actually do differ from platform to platform. Okay, so that's all minutia, but I wanted you to be a little comfortable with the fact that this is all numbers internally because it's going to lead into the sort of stuff we're going to do. I'm very happy to say that uh, we did not hit a weird surprise with the, with the uh, backslash R, backslash N. That made me nervous for a minute there. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move on to talking about this output debug string A. And, and why that was actually A. And then I'm gonna leave this, this carefoo in here, the thing we used to inspect, because that will dovetail nicely into exactly what I wanted to talk about after that, which was variables and, and data. So, okay. If we go back to our situation here, um, when I call this output debug string, it is not actually going to send some pretty string to anybody, right? The string is just conceptual for our benefit. We saw what it was internally, it's all of these numbers. So what's getting passed in some sense to the thing that's being called, and we'll look in, you know, the how and why things are passed is, is a topic that we'll spend a bit of time on in a, in a bit. But what is actually passed is the series of numbers. And those series of numbers as we've seen are all based on that ASCII table. Uh, that table is what tells the computer essentially uh, all of the code that was written was conforming to that table. So when the, when the code in Windows goes to actually do stuff with the things that were passed in, it's going to translate each number as if it was from that ASCII table. And what happened was way back when everything in Windows was ASCII back in the 16-bit days. Uh, but then eventually they found because Windows was an international product, product and uh, international computing needed to start being able to represent things uh, like languages, like say Chinese, for example, which maybe has more glyphs than can fit in a standard encoding uh, that, that uh, you know, that you would have like, you know, a simple encoding like ASCII, you may have tens of thousands of characters potentially that you need to encode. They developed something called Unicode, which is a different standard for how you encode characters and it supports a lot more things than just that simple ASCII table. If you look at the ASCII table uh, that we were looking at here, you can see it only goes up to 127. I think other people were saying that, uh, that the A here actually refers to ANSI, which is another standard, I guess, or, or the, is, you know, refers to the ANSI encoded standard, which is ASCII, I, I believe, plus additional uh, things that, that perhaps aren't in there. I'm not actually sure uh, uh, whether the A stands for ASCII or ANSI, but it's totally relevant for any of the things we're going to talk about. Point being, uh, they developed a thing called Unicode so they could start to address markets where people wanted to be able to save text in their native languages, which makes a lot of sense. But in order to do that, you could no longer have Windows working entirely in these ASCII encoded strings. So what they did was they expanded to using 
and encoding that could support a lot more characters. And when they did that, they changed all of the APIs in Windows to accept these new character strings. They were called wide character strings. The encoding was called UTF-16. Uh, and we can actually search for that. Uh, oh, <laughs> my, my sizing definitely definitely paid off here. So you can take a look at this here if you want more information on it, if you go to the Wikipedia page. UTF-16 was the encoding that they decided to use for Windows. Uh, and at that time, I don't even know if UTF-8 existed. It might have. I don't quite remember exactly. Plan 9, the operating system, uh, I believe those were the guys who invented UTF-8 uh, and, and switched to it. And there's some reasons why it's a lot better than UTF-16. But at the time, Windows decided to go with UTF-16, which meant that all of the characters were encoded differently. So if I was to call the actual output debug string function that was for those wide characters, uh, if I was to actually compile it, trying to pass it a string that's encoded in that format, the C compiler, since the compiler knows what type of string this is, it actually tells us right off the bat that, hey, guess what? You cannot actually pass this kind of string to this particular function because it's encoded in ASCII and I wanted something encoded in those wide characters. And that's all well and good, but you can see there's a little bit more to the puzzle than just that, it's, it, just that simple explanation, which is that you'll notice that it doesn't actually complain about output debug string. I called output debug string, but it complained about output debug string W, and that's a little confusing. So what's going on there? Well, the answer is because when they actually made that transition and they went from uh, doing the, uh, the ASCII encodings to be doing the UTF-16 encodings, they didn't want to break all the code that was already written uh, to the old API. They wanted you to be able to call the same functions and they wanted you to be able to just convert the strings and go from there. Uh, so I don't really know what the rationale is necessarily behind that. Um, I guess it's just so you would have an easier time porting your code, I guess. You know, you just replace the strings, you wouldn't have to replace all the calls with new calls uh, that have different names. I'm not sure. But anyway, what they decided to do was they decided to actually use what's called a macro. Uh, and a macro is a way of basically replacing strings in C. Now, I'm actually going to show you that macro, even though you don't quite have to understand it completely yet. But I'll actually show it to you here. You can see this little block of code here. What this block of code does is it basically says, well, if I'm compiling for Unicode, then I'm going to make output debug string, the word in all the code, mean output debug string W. But if I am not in Unicode, I'm going to make output debug string convert to output debug string a, right? And you'll notice the output debug string A was the thing that I called directly. So what's going on here? Well, what's going on is that when you actually create a project in Visual Studio, it's actually set to which one of those things you wanted to use, Unicode or ASCII. And that macro, when Windows.h gets inserted in here, that macro will actually do some stuff that changes uh, which output debug string we will call, whether it replaces this with output debug string A or output debug string W, output debug string w. the default for a project when you create it is actually to use UTF-16, to use the wide characters. So what it did was when I did that thing, remember uh, yesterday I did that thing where I said new project, when it created that project for me, it set all the settings, uh, which we'll go into a little bit, but not, not in too much detail, but it set all the settings for our project to basically be Unicode. So we end up calling effectively this when we just type output streetbug string w. That's what it's actually doing when it goes to compile. And of course, that's not going to accept the type of string we want. So what I did yesterday when I kind of slyly said, oh, I can fix that, but I'm not going to talk about exactly why yet. I just changed it to output debug string A because I don't actually need to go change all the settings of my project to be Unicode because I know that all it's going to do is do that AW switch, right? So what I've done is I've just done the AW switch manually in the code and now everything works, right? Now I can, I can call my function and I can have it print out what I wanted in ASCII. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to you. I realize there's a lot of information there to absorb. Uh, I will take a quick milk hit, but then we're going to dive right into more stuff. Hopefully this is not too much uh, or too fast. Okay. So let's talk about what happened here. Um, <clears throat> well, obviously when you are programming stuff, I said some things, I was like, oh yeah, you know, we called a function and we did that and here was the function and it called it and then I typed a string in here and it kind of passed it, but 
I didn't really talk about how you pass things or even like what these things were when we kind of went over what they meant. I didn't really say what they actually were. And so what I want to talk about now is variables. Uh, I think John Blow was joking in Twitter the other day. I think he asked, or on the Twitch stream, he said, what's a variable? And I, I, was, I was joking with him, like, we're not going to get to that for a while. And I was, I was telling the truth. We didn't cover it yesterday, but we're going to cover it today. So basically, the way computers work is you are essentially always having the CPU, the central processing unit, the thing that you buy from Intel most of the time, or sometimes from ARM these days on uh, I, somebody, I don't know exactly who's going to fab it, I suppose. Apple or somebody like this fabs, or I don't know who fabs ARM chips, you know, in your Android phone or your iOS device. That central processing unit, the thing that actually does the work inside the computer, that thing is basically just an engine for manipulating numerical values. That's what it does. It sits around all day and operates on numerical values. And it has a gigantic store called memory of these numeric values. It pulls them inside to the processor. It operates on them in things called registers. And then it puts them back out to memory. And that is all it does. And we're going to talk a lot about that model and that way of thinking about things, exactly what the CPU actually is doing, or at least mostly what the CPU is doing at a conceptual level, uh, as a good way to think about most of what you're doing when you're programming. But for the moment, the only reason I want to point that out is because if we want to actually have the CPU do stuff for us, we need to start thinking about those numerical values. Because all we're going to be doing in everything that we type in in code is just coming up with basically ways of telling, different ways of telling the CPU to manipulate those numbers in some way that we want to produce an outcome. So in C, what we can do is we can at any time ask for some space for a new one of these numbers. So I talked about int, which I said was basically a number value. Uh, I can basically ask for an int, which is some number value. I can give it a name. So I'm going to call this integer. And then I can basically say uh, semicolon, and that is a standalone uh, statement there. That, that will basically say, give me space for a single numeric value. And I can then start doing things with it that look a lot like math, right? I can say integer equals five, and that will make this name, you know, that I, that I reserved here, I can, that will make that equal to five. I can say integer equals five plus five, and it will actually do the math here, or five plus two, that sort of thing. Uh, I can even do integer equals integer plus five if I wanted to, and I can, so I can refer to it in here. And the reason that I bring that one up before I go through and talk about these in a little more detail is because one of the interesting things that happened to me, I learned to program before I learned math. I was seven when I learned to program and I hadn't really learned math yet. Uh, and I shouldn't say math because obviously I knew like addition and stuff like that, but I hadn't learned uh, algebra. We didn't have algebra until I was in like sixth grade or fifth grade or something, fifth grade maybe, I don't even know, but it was very, very long. Uh, it was years after I learned to program that anyone ever taught me algebra. And so I grew up thinking that equals means assignment because in coding, what equals means is it means, at least in C, uh, is equals means take the value that's on the right hand side and make the thing on the left hand side become equal to that value. Now that's not what it means in math. Um, in math, equals means equivalence. It means that the two things on either side are equivalent to each other. So you could never write, this statement is completely meaningless. Integer equals integer plus five. We all know that can't be true because if you were to actually do, if you know algebra, if any of you out there know some algebra, you know that I can subtract integer from both sides and you would get that. And I'm sure there's some people out there who know a lot more math than I do. I am not certainly a, a math expert who probably know some kind of algebra somewhere that someone invented where zero does equal five. And there's some special things you can do in this algebra or other stuff like that. But for any algebra that you learned, certainly in fifth grade, you could not have zero equal to five. That is not gonna fly. Uh, but it's okay in programming because equals doesn't mean math equals. What it means is assignment. It's basically a copy. It means copy this over to this. So it doesn't matter what's on this side. You can refer to it just fine in here. And what it will do is it will use the value from right before that line. So basically integer here will just mean whatever integer was back up here. So in this case, the last thing I did is I, I made it equal to seven, right? I said integer is seven. So this line will effectively read integer equals seven plus five or 12. That's all that's gonna do, no harm done. And so let me tell you, it was really, really hard. 
uh, for me to learn algebra. It took a long time for me to learn algebra because I had no idea what they were talking about at all. When they would write this stuff up there, they would write things uh, where you're supposed to solve. They'd write, you know, you, they'd write stuff like, you know, two, uh, you know, two times uh, a equals, you know, uh, uh, you know, a plus six or something like this. They'd write that on the board, and I'd be like, "What does that mean? That's, that's doesn't make any sense at all. That's not. You can't. You can't even. You can't put two times. Two x doesn't go on the side. What are you talking about? It's single." Single expression on the, yeah, it, it, was, it was a mess. But anyway, fortunately, I eventually learned that there were two different equals and, and that kind of saved the day. So I can do math now. I couldn't do it back then. All right, so basically, here are some lines that I'm gonna talk about now so that we can uh, get, you know, get a little bit further in our discussion here. I am going to use uh, that, that uh, procedure that I said before where I'm going to set a breakpoint so we can see what this code actually does. So this first line here, like I said, this is basically telling C that I want some space uh, to, to basically represent a number. And I'm gonna use this watch window again, and I'm gonna start now to talk about the watch window for real and teach you how to use it. I kind of glossed over it before because I didn't want to get into it too much. Anyway, uh, so in the watch window, what I can do is I can type the name of any of these things that I have reserved space for that happen to be uh, around where, where I'm looking. So integer, I can just type it in, and it will go figure out what the value of integer is at the time when the program has stopped, right? So you can see here, you have uh, integer equals five on this line, but I've stopped on the line. And the way debugging works is it will not actually execute the line that you stop on until I ask it to. It freezes before the execution of the line. So if the yellow arrow is on a line, it means it has not actually executed that line yet. So what you will see, and this is very important, I want you to pay very close attention to this. What you will see is that there is a value in here that appears nowhere in the program. Um, you can toggle back and forth between these. There's a there's a little bit of a, a there's a little bit of a of a catch in here that I'm going to talk about perhaps later. Uh, maybe maybe not till tomorrow though. But anyway, you will note that there's a value in here that appears nowhere in the program. And the reason that there's a value there that appears nowhere in the program is because if I simply ask for space for something then if I have never actually put something specific into it, then the actual contents of it can be whatever they are. Uh, there is no requirement for the compiler to do anything with that value other than reserve space. So it could literally at this point in the program be anything. Now that's not entirely true based on the compilation settings that are set up for this particular program. It is true in an actual shipping executable that you would ship, but it's not quite true yet but I'm gonna save why, that, why that's the case for a little bit later. So anyway, suffice to say, the compiler could do anything it wants with that value as long as it reserves space for us. That's the only thing it's required to do. And so it can be any value and it is any value. Now, when I actually uh, go through these lines here, uh, it will actually start to obey the things that we asked for and actually put the values that we told it to put into that space. Now, what you will notice is it stopped here. I don't want to have to keep setting a breakpoint. You know, I could set a breakpoint there and then run to it, right? Uh, so I could, I could hit F5 to continue running the program till the next breakpoint, which is what it will do. Uh, and you can see that it is assigned five to it, just like we asked. And the watch window turns that red for you. So you can see that it changed since the last time uh, you actually uh, looked at, at, at it in the program. But since what you want to do in debugging very often is just go through the lines of code sequentially and see what they're doing while watching stuff in the watch window, I ha you know, can, can actually shortcut that process by using uh, step into and step over, which are in the debug menu. So you can see down here there's step into and step over. There's also step out. We'll talk about what all those are in a second. But the one that we need right now is actually, well, actually, to be honest, you could use either of these, but uh, the one that we want right now is step over, which is F10. And what that does is it says, anytime I hit F10, do whatever is on the current line. Just do that. And you can see it did it, right? Uh, we're, we're seven now, just like we wanted. Five plus two is seven. Uh, and we've moved to the next line, but it did not run any further. So it did not do this integer plus seven bit, which is what we wanted. Now, if I hit F10 again, you can see that it's taken integer, which was seven, and it added seven to it, which became 14, which is exactly what we'd expect. Everything is happy. So here is simple math executing in C, uh, very lovely. And we have now learned how to inspect the values uh, that the compiler is actually using, well, that the, the code is actually using when it runs.
Now I know this may sound strange, but actually you will find that there's not going to be a whole lot more to the math that we do than what you see right here. One of the interesting things about C is it's a very low level language, which means there aren't tons and tons and tons of different types you have to learn and different things you have to learn. There's actually only very few things that you'll have to learn. And in fact, by the end of a couple of these sessions, we'll have touched on most of them. So this is actually just a pretty, you know, this, this is not actually toy code in any, in any particular way. You will see me when I'm actually coding the game, I will be doing exactly this. I will be doing in integer all the time. I will be doing math like this all the time. Now I won't, assign five to something and assign seven to it right away because that doesn't make very much sense. But basically this exact process is how we will be doing math very much like this on integers. Okay. So what I want to do now is just throw out a couple other things before we, uh, before we go any, any further, which is to sort of say int has a little more meaning than just number. There are in fact several different ways I can say number in C. I can say char, which is something that is small, let's say. I can say short, which is something that is medium. And I can say int, which is something that is large. Now there's also other kinds when we get to 64-bit programming, but at the moment we're only 32 bits. So right now this is basically what we're looking at. I can also add some things to here, uh, which I will do. Okay, so we have now a larger set of things. Um, I'm going to put U at the end of these so I can talk about them separately and maybe I'll put S at the end of these. Okay, so basically what I've done is I've defined a bunch of these kind of variables just like the number I defined before, but I used a bunch of different keywords when I did it. And so what do these different keywords mean? So hopefully most of you are somewhat familiar with binary, but maybe you're not. So I will simply say, uh, if you're not familiar with binary, you may want to go learn a little bit about it separately because I'm not going to cover it in detail in this particular series, but basically computers always work in terms of bits and a bit is a zero or a one. It is the simplest possible thing you can pretty much do. Uh, it has two states basically, it is on or it is off. Uh, and in, in the actual computer, in the actual CPU itself, these typically correspond to actual uh, electricity levels or things like this. There's actually a high and a low or things like that. But basically computers are always operating on bits, zero and one. And so what you might wonder is if computers always use zero and one, how do they ever actually represent values like 10 or 30 or 60, let alone 4 billion, for example? And the answer is you just start stringing bits together. It's the same way that we represent things in decimal. In decimal, we have, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Those are the actual numerals we have. And when we want to represent something higher than 9, we don't invent a new symbol. What we actually do is we just put a 1 further over, right? So we say, oh, okay, I had 9, I want to go to 10. I don't put some other value in here, right? I don't start saying it's V. What I do instead is I put a one further and then I go back to zero and I start over two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then if I wrap that, I go. Well, the exact same thing happens in binary. If I want to represent say the number, you know, three in binary. Well, uh, basically if I have zero in binary, right? Uh, that is still zero. If I have one in binary, that is still one. But now if I want to go to two, I can't put in a two because there is no two. So what I have to do is put a one in the next slot and start over at zero again, right? So now I'm at 10. 10 in binary is actually two. So if I want three, well, I just go to the next number, which is 11, right? And that keeps going. So if I were to go up again, this would wrap to zero, this would wrap to zero, and I add a one. We're now at 100. 100 binary uh, obviously is, you know, sounds like a, a super huge number, uh, but it is actually just four. Uh, so yeah, there you go. You can count in binary, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's fun, right? So what you will quickly learn if you start doing this, you know, out to more detail is you need a lot of ones and zeros to represent the numbers you might want to represent in a program. So nobody ever, for the most part, uh, writes in languages anymore where you have fundamental data types, such as the ones we were talking about like int, where they have fundamental types that you're going to start talking about that are one bit. 
It's very, very rare. Most of the time, one bit things are aggregated up into bigger things. The smallest thing that people typically talk about these days is eight bits together. And that is what care is. Care is basically eight bits. So this is eight bits. Now, if you think about what eight bits means, right? It basically means that we had something that looks like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? Something looks like that. So it'll take you a while if you're gonna count up to see what the maximum number we can actually represent is here. But there's a short way to do it, a relatively quick way to do it, if you have a calculator handy. And the answer is, if you were going to do something in decimal, for example, if I, if, if you, if I said you were going to have three decimal digits, right? So you know, if one decimal digit would be zero through nine, so I could represent 10 things that way, basically. Uh, if I was gonna have two decimal digits, that'd be zero through 99, that's 100 things, essentially. And if I had three decimal digits, I have zero through 999, which is a thousand things. What is the rule there that we can use to quickly determine for some number of decimals how many there are? Well, it's always the base, which was 10, right? Base 10 is the decimal system. It's always that raised to the power of the number of digits. So for example, if I said three digits, right? And I said there were a thousand things I could represent. Well, that's 10 to the third power. It's 10 times 10 times 10. It's pretty easy to see why that is. It's because Basically, if I do zero, you know, if I do my zero, one, two, three, four, five thing, and I get up to nine, there were 10 things I could enumerate by counting to nine. If I then add another numeral, right? If I add two numerals, I'm essentially saying I had 10 possibilities here and 10 possibilities here, and I can pick any combination of those, right? I can, I can have, you know, a three here and a, a six here or whatever, a one here and a nine here. So they multiply. Adding another decimal digit multiplies by 10 all of the things you could have done when you started, right? And so basically raising something to the power, caret is the symbol we use for that when you're, we're typing because when we can't actually put a superscript, we can't even put a little superscript three, that's how weak it is, but that is the syntax usually for doing power in when you're typing in ASCII. Uh, not in C, just when we're typing. So anyway, when you actually do that uh, with, uh, with eight things, you would get two to the eighth power. That tells you what the maximum value can do is. Now, I happen to know uh, what two to the eighth power is. I don't blame you if you don't, but if you program in low level code, after a while, you will very quickly start to learn what the powers of two are. And you can start to recite them. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 10, 24, 20, 48, 4096, 81, 92. And at some point, you're just like, you'll stop. But for the most part, you've learned a lot of them just because they come up so often. So I know that 2 to the 8 is 256. Um, so basically, with 8 bits, you can represent 256 uh, different values, right? Now, I want to say very clearly that that does not necessarily mean that those values are zero to 255, right? Is that what that means? The answer is no, it doesn't necessarily mean that. And the reason is because of this guy down here. Now you'll notice uh, I had two different things that both use care. One was care and one was care unsigned. What did those mean? Well, what those mean is whether or not I would like to represent negative values. By default, if I say care, I am talking about potentially negative values. If I say care unsigned, I am only talking about unsigned values. So unsigned values, uh, this would be eight bits unsigned, also 256 values. But this actually is zero to 255. That contains, uh, that would let me represent all the numbers from zero to 255, this guy right here, small u. On the other hand, this guy cannot represent those. What he actually does is he goes from negative 128 to 127. Um, anything other than that, uh, if I tried to go up to 128, it would not work. No, can't do. All right, that's a very ugly comment. We're gonna delete that, pretend that never happened. But point being, uh, you know, you cannot actually, uh, you know what? We're gonna use mathematical notation here. Just, there you go. Okay, so this can represent negative 128 to 127. This can represent zero to 255. And basically they both represent 256 different values, but they just represent them slightly differently because one wants to, to handle negatives and one wants to handle only positives. So you get more range out of the positives. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. These guys are exactly the same thing, just with more bits. Uh, so if I were to go here and group these similarly, this is 16 bits, right? That's uh, 65536 different values. Um, 
Again, that's just the power of 2 to the 16th. Uh, and this guy is 32 bits or 4 billion. Now, it's not quite 4 billion. It's like, you know, there's some noise in there. I don't remember the exact ones. That's higher powers of 2 than I can count, but it's roughly around 4 billion. So, these are just ways of me asking to essentially you know, reserve a certain amount of space, right? I need enough bits to hold a particular type of value. So if I want to be able to store relatively large values, I can ask for an int. If I care that they are signed or unsigned, I can specify that. If I need negative values, for example, I'll use this one. If I need negative values, but that I only need 16 bits, I'd use this one. If I wanted, <coughs> excuse me, eight bits, but I, uh, I actually want the full range uh, to 255 and don't care about negative numbers, then I can use this one. And that is really all of these do. Uh, they're setting me up to start to do things uh, with those. Now the math that happens on these, obviously, is affected by which one you set. So let's say, for example, I'm gonna define another set here. I'm gonna define a test value uh, for, for int. And I'm gonna say the test equals 127, right? And then the next thing I'm going to do, uh, actually, you know what, let's, let's do this a little differently. I'm gonna say test equals 255. And then the next thing I'm going to do, we're going to say test equals test plus one. I'm just going to add it to add one to that value. All right, let us run the program. Oh, one thing I should mention I haven't mentioned yet. If you are in the middle, if you've stopped here on a line, like I said in the debugger, you may wonder, how do I recompile my program and restart? Shift F5. So F5 runs the program. Shift F5 stops running the program. So you can get out of that, you know, assuming Visual Studio hasn't crashed. You can get out of that pretty quickly. Anyway. So if you hit F5 uh, and go and stop on this line, we can now ask to inspect test. It's not initialized anything, like I said, because we didn't set it to initial value or anything. We can step over that line. We get 255. We can now step over this line, and you would expect potentially to see 256, uh, which is what 255 plus 1 is. And boom, that is exactly what we get. Everything's good, right? Well, what would happen if I go back here and I change this to a care unsigned. Now we know that only contains eight bits. So I have set it to essentially the maximum value that it can hold. When I get here, we set it to 255, which is exactly what we were expecting. But then when I try to add one to it, game over. We wrap back to zero. And the reason for that is because the way that arithmetic is defined on the actual CPU most of the time, in fact, and it depends on exactly what's going on on the CPU. Uh, there's different types of adding. There's saturated ads and wrapping ads and things like this. Uh, but the way that it's actually defined uh, on the CPU that's in this machine and the way that is defined to work in C is that when you add one to a, to a number which is already at its highest value, instead of it staying at the highest value, which would be called a saturating addition, it does not do that. It wraps. Uh, it goes back to zero. So basically, it's like zero to 255 and then zero again, and then 255 and zero again. And I could keep going at it for an So I could add one all day and I would go right back up to 255, go back to zero and go around and around and around. Now, this is sometimes called an overflow. That's a term that you'll see used sometimes. An overflow is a term for when you are at the maximum value and then you wrap that value. You, you overflow over it and go uh, to the lower value. Overflow gets used for a number of different things, so I wouldn't get too hung up on the term because there's a lot of different things that could refer to, but sometimes that's called that and you'll, you'll see that said. It's uh, that overflowed the value. Okay, so what I wanted to do with this is just give you a little bit of a basis for how these things work, but and, and you know, you could do math on them and that's all well and good. We now can inspect the program. We can kind of see what's going on. We can see that there are real sort of boundaries to the things that we are talking about on here. They are stored as actual bits. And when we use up more bits than we have, we see the effects of that and so on and so forth. Now, there's something big that I, that I need to talk about, which is how negative numbers actually work, uh, which is a little complicated. You'll notice I used an unsigned one for this test because I didn't want to deal with uh, negative values yet because they require more explanation. I'm going to hold off on that a little bit, and instead I'm going to do a little tease for tomorrow because I said that we were going to do some assembly language tonight, and I would like to do a little bit of that. So what I want to do before we go any further with doing anything in C, just using this, just the simple math, what I want to do before we go any further is I want to introduce you to understanding what is actually happening in the code because we actually have some stuff now that we could understand. So I'm going to show you 
what it does and how to understand what it does. And by the way, this is uh, again a big reason why I'm glad that uh, Microsoft has released this thing, this uh, community edition, because I think there's some stuff in here uh, that will help people uh, that is not necessarily present in the Express version. Okay. So if I stop the program on a line like I did before, just using the same old breakpoint thing, I hit F5, I ran there. If I right click on that line that I was on, there's actually a thing you can do down here called go to disassembly. Now if I say go to disassembly, you will see that everything freaks out for a second. But if I look again closely, I can see that my code is still there. Here is the code that I've typed in, but there's just all this other stuff all lying around. It's crazy, right? There's all sorts of crap in here. Well, what this crap actually is, is this is actually a textual representation of the actual machine code that is actually being executed by the actual processor. And believe it or not, as tedious as it is may be to look at this and read this, I actually do this often to debug problems. I believe it is essential to be able to at least rudimentary read it. And if you're anything like me, I think you will start to feel a pretty big sense of connection to your code that you don't ever feel in any other way when you actually understand exactly what the processor is actually doing instead of just the sort of vague, abstract, semantic things that higher level languages encourage you to work in. Um, yes, those abstractions can sometimes help you get work done faster, but you lose a certain connection to what's actually going on in the code that is very unsatisfying and sometimes actually hampers your progress. So uh, I wanted to get down and dirty very quickly, and so I'm just going to do a little assembly language tease, and then to, you know, tomorrow when we start talking about actual C code uh, in a little more detail besides just the simple math, I'm going to actually start to show you some more of what all these other things do. So let's take a look. What I want you to do, if you're following along at home, is I want you to go into the debug windows here, and what you're gonna do is you're going to uh, find the one that says registers. It's this one right here. Now this is a awful, awful, awful window. It is absolutely terrible. Uh, you can tell they spent no time on it, but what are you gonna do? It's the only way to really get a clean register display. There's, there's some other things you can sort of do to hack it, but. When you right click on that, you will notice that there's not much in there uh, at, at the moment, but when you right click on that, you can actually go and you can ask for all kinds of good stuff. Let's get some SSC flags in there. Let's get the flags register. Let's, let's do everything. Um, all right, so you can see this crazy window, if you enable everything, is basically a representation of what's called the registers of the CPU. And the way a CPU works is basically as you go through the code, uh, that it needs to execute. It is given very simple instructions, and those instructions basically boil down to going and getting some memory, pulling it into a register, which is the th thing that it can work on. It's inside the CPU that it can actually operate on. So it's taking a little piece of memory, pulling it into a thing called a register. It then has commands that can operate on those registers to change the values of them, and then it will have commands that put those registers back out to memory. So basically you've got this big old huge memory, four gigs, eight gigs, 16 gigabytes, however many is in your machine, however much your machine said when you bought it, or how much you stuck in there if you built it yourself. Um, all that memory basically gets pulled into the, the CPU. It gets moved into registers, which are, there are not very many of them. It, it's tiny. There's, you know, eight, 16, 32 of them, something like that. There's a small number of registers depending on the CPU where it can actually store values. It can work on those those values and then it puts them back out to memory and everything that happens to your computer basically works in that very simple way. There's a few other things that it can do, but for the most part, almost everything it does is based around just, it's, it's almost like this just machine that's just sucking in memory and spitting memory back out and in, inside it's these registers that are churning through it to do operations on it. It does this obviously very fast and operates on tons of memory, but it's all going through these registers and getting modified in there. Now, what I want you to look at is I want you to look at this line of assembly language right here. Uh, basically what, uh, what this is doing is it is going to do our, our test equals 255, test equals test plus one, uh, right? It's, these are the two lines of code. So it's gonna do this, it's gonna do the equals 255 first, uh, and then it's going to, to try to increment that value. So what you can see is there's a number here in the assembly what that number is, is that is basically where you are in the actual code. So you have to remember last week, I explained the fact that you essentially, when you compile a program and link it, you end up with this, with this sort of file that's all the code that needs to be executed. Windows loads that code in, right? 
and when it actually has that code in memory, it's going to eventually point the CPU to some of it, and it's going to start executing right there. When it starts executing that code, I mean, that code is actually somewhere in memory. It exists somewhere in memory, and this is basically a thing that's telling you where in the code you actually are. It is an address in memory of the code. And we will get into what memory and addresses are and all that sort of stuff, but this is basically, you can almost think of it as a line number. It's not exactly that, but it's almost like a line number that tells you where in the actual code you were. And there are some things, that, there are some reasons why you might want to know that. Uh, but mostly what we're going to look at right here is this, MOV. Now, what is MOV? The way that uh, machine code is printed out so that it's easy to read uh, is, it, you know, when it's actually being executed by the CPU, there is no MOV in the CPU, obviously. It's actually working on binary encoded uh, things that tell it what instructions to do. But for human readability, the way uh, things are printed out when we ask for a disassembly, which is the actual code that our thing is executing, what it does is it will use a, again, like much like the ASCII table, it uses a table that has things called mnemonics, which are basically uh, these little shorthands, to basically look at whatever the actual machine code is, whatever the actual instruction is that's going to be executed, and turn it into a human readable form. MOV, of course, stands for move. It is the mnemonic that says, I want to move memory from one place to another. Excuse me. I've got to take a milk it now and again to save the voice. Anyway. Uh, basically what it is, is mob is a command that the processor can execute, which takes some value, which you can see here, 0FFH, uh, we'll talk about that in a second, and moves it to a location. Now 0FFH, uh, I, I wasn't going to super get into this, uh, but since, since, you know, since we're at the, that point uh, where, where it's probably good to start talking about it, I will, I will mention it briefly. How did I get to that crazy ASCII table? I want to use the same ASCII table we were looking at before. Ah, this is not the one. Uh, which one did I click on? This one, here we go. So when I clicked on this one before, you remember I got confused because there were these different kinds. Well, uh, the other kind that was in here, I said hexadecimal, it's this one right here. You can see hexadecimal is actually a way of basically saying, okay, I want to represent numbers uh, in a more compact notation. And you can look at them here, they're lined up exactly with, with the decimals. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9. When you get to 10, instead of getting to 10, you actually just go A, B, C, D, E, F, which allows you to represent 16 numbers before you actually get to 10. It's base 16. Like binary was base 2 and decimal is base 10. This is actually base 16. What it means is you go 0 to F, then you go 10 through 1F, right, which is down here and so on. Now we'll talk a little bit more about that because we should probably practice that a little bit. I don't want to belabor the fact, but point being, it's just a more compact notation for decimal. Uh, and so you might ask yourself, well, all right, so 0 FFH, what is that? I'm telling you, it is a hexadecimal constant. And thankfully, uh, since you probably only just heard me briefly uh, say out what, what hexadecimal is, you wouldn't necessarily know what it is. Thankfully, if you hover over it, Visual Studio will actually translate the hexadecimal value. The H, of course, is not part of the value. That's just a thing that tells you it's hexadecimal. That's actually just a notation, if you will. The FF is actually the value. Um, so if you look at that, it will translate FF for you to 255. So for now, you can actually cheat and just use that. But we'll talk about hexadecimal a little more in a future episode so that you can be more comfortable and you can actually just read these things without getting too confused. To be honest, it's not that important to read hexadecimal super well because I am terrible at reading hexadecimal uh, and I'm still okay at programming, so it's fine. Uh, but it's good to know exactly that, you know, what it basically is you're looking at. So anyway, you can look here and you can see 255. Now you can also do some stuff, you can do some experiments. In this watch window, if you right click, it's got a hexadecimal display option too. Because hexadecimal is pretty common use for C programmers. And so you can see here, it'll give us a thing. OX is the notation that C uses. 0H is the thing that, uh, that assembly language uses. But uh, 0x is the way it uses it, so cc is actually the hexadecimal notation for that. So anyway, don't worry about too much about that. I don't want to push too, much th too many things into your brain at once, so we'll talk about that a little bit in a future exo. But point being, this is the 255. Now you'll notice that's what we were going to assign. So the 255 is actually just a constant that appears here in the assembly language code. And what it's going to do is going to move this constant, it's going to move it into the location specified by test. Um, we're going to ignore the byte pointer part for now because I don't want to talk about pointers until the next episode. But you can see when we execute this line of assembly, again using the F10 to step over it, you can see that it moved the 255 in just as we asked it to. So it moved this value to 
to here. Pretty simple, right? Now what that was, is that was a memory to memory move. What that means is that it never actually went into the registers that I was talking about. It just went ahead and moved the 255, uh, which was actually in the code itself, right? It moved that into this byte pointer, but it never actually occupied a register with it. And what that means is that if I go and look at my registers here, this is actually the printout of the registers. You will notice that that value, the FF does not appear anywhere here because it never actually got moved in there. In the next statement, you will see move ZX. That is actually going to move it from that location, the test location that we have specified. It is actually going to move that into an actual register. And the reason it has to move into register is because it wants to add one to it. And in order to actually do math on things, the processor generally has to move them into a register. So I step over that, and now you will see EAX, which was the destination register. Now I'm not even gonna to try to explain why it's called EAX. That is a topic for much further down the road. But point being, there's a register called EAX, and now that register has that value that we tried to move into it, right? Now what we're going to do uh, is we are going to add one to EAX, right? We are going to actually say we want it to increment by one. There we go. And you can see it wrapped just like I said it was going to uh, on the, the FS because basically that was at 255. It has to go to the next, you know, the next binary piece, um, if that makes sense. And then it's going to move the result back into test. So here's the interesting part. Uh, that I want to, to sort of leave as the tease for next time, because all of this is obviously very confusing to anyone who, is, who hasn't worked with any of this. Uh, you'll notice that the one is still here. So when I actually had the FF, right, uh, we, we ended up with 100 hexadecimal. Now there's no way to switch this into binary mode, so unfortunately I can't actually show you that, but that's 256, right? If I actually go in here and ask to see uh, what 100 is in hexadecimal, you'll see that it's 256. So we went from FF, which is 255, to 100, which is 256. But remember, that's what was supposed to happen when it was defined as an integer, which can display very large values. I still have it defined as, uh, you, know, you know, as only eight bits wide. So how, you know, what's going on there? I, this, this should actually record as 256. So this next line here, uh, which is going to take a register and move it uh, back into test, that line there should set test equal to 256, right? And t t t can't even be 256. I don't know what's going on. What's going on? I have no idea. And you'll see when we step over, actually, you will see that, in fact, if I look at test afterwards, it is zero like it was supposed to be. It did, in fact, wrap. Uh, and you can see that again. I'll, I'll, I'll load it back up for you here. If I go to disassembly and leave test open, uh, you can see I move the value 255 in there, as we said it would. We then uh, do the add in the register, which does not actually change the value of test yet. And then we move it on back and we get to zero, right? Well, uh, what actually happened there is the registers in x86 uh, and x64 assembly and so on, um, are this, this particular register is 32 bits. You can see that even in hexadecimal, it has a lot of characters there, right? This register happens to be 32 bits wide. So what happens when you wrap uh, the, the lower uh, eight bits of it like that, it still is able to store that value just fine. It could go all the way up to four billion, no problem. But you are also able in assembly language to reference smaller parts of this register. You can pull out just that bottom eight bits right there, uh, which happens to be zero, zero. And that is exactly what AL is. AL is basically the reference to EAX, which says only pull out the bottom two bits. And you can actually see that kind of in here. The A is the important part. It is the register A. A, B, C, D, right? You can kind of see that there's A, B, C, D registers. But the way that you refer to them, actually, if you refer to EAX versus AL, for example, the way you add to the, to the piece that's A, actually tells you what portion of them, like how you want them to be treated for that particular instruction. So in this case, the processor didn't actually have to do any extra work to make sure that we got the, the value that we were expecting to get by only using eight bits because it could just do the math in a thing that was 32 bits and then just take the bottom two bits of it. And hey, who cares what the rest of this value was because we're never gonna see it. Okay, so I don't expect you to understand much of what I just said. 
uh, because we are going to go into that into a lot more detail soon. But I just wanted to give you a brief taste of what's going on there so you can see uh, that even though you probably don't understand what a lot of this is, and I said memory and I said registers and I said these things uh, that are, are we haven't really covered in much detail, so you're going to be a little confused about what they are and they're going to be kind of new to you. Even though that is probably very confusing, I hope you can still follow the very basic part, which is that in this language, we have written something. We assigned 255 to a value, we added it to one. Uh, sorry, we added one to it and assigned it back to itself. That was very understandable, hopefully, to most people who are watching. But I hope this sequence of instructions was also relatively easy to understand because there's only four of them. All it did was move a constant into some place in memory, move memory into a register, add one to the register, move it back out to the memory. So hopefully you can see that there's really not that much going on in the CPU for code in C. Code in C translates into relatively small code on the CPU. And I will be able to explain to you what this assembly language code does in great detail in the next episode, and you will be, I think, fairly comfortable with it. And throughout the whole series, uh, once the actual series proper starts on Monday, we are constantly going to harp on, uh, you know, sort of, we we're constantly going to adhere to a rule which is always know what is actually happening in the machine. And a lot of people think that that's really hard to do. And they also think that it's very slow to understand those things. It's very slow to program in a low level language, all these things. I've actually seen things to that effect. Uh, of course, on Reddit, someone posted the, the handmade hero thing and there were some snide comments to that, to, to that effect, I guess. But it's really not true. There's really not that much code that gets generated from code when you write it. And that's almost a good thing. If you're writing something that's fast and efficient, there shouldn't be that much code generated from what you do because you should be doing very directly the things that you're trying to accomplish. And you can layer things on top of each other so that you don't have to write things multiple times. But each individual piece that you write is actually very easy to understand. It's very simple to understand what happens in a CPU, especially if you're programming in C because it is a low level language. Um, but even once you understand the C code, you can sort of start to translate that to even some higher level languages. I don't really like programming in those higher level languages because I don't like all the things that they put between me and the processor. Since I happen to know what the processor typically does when I do things. Um, and, you know, again, I'm not even an assembly language expert. So I don't, you know, uh, the guys at RAD who, a lot of the people who I worked with at RAD, for example, they are way more assembly than me. You know, they are, they are total as assembly uh, people who know it in and out. I know it basically because I think it's good to know and I, I debug things that way and I like to understand the performance of code through it and I like to understand what the CPU does and that sort of stuff. Um, so even with just a, a relatively basic understanding of assembly like what I have, it's actually very easy to understand what the CPU does when you write C code. And that allows you to always be very closely connected uh, with what, what the processor is doing so that you, you can write efficient, good code, and you can understand what's going on. You can debug it easily. It, it's just really this nice connection that you have when you always understand what's going on. And I think part of being a good programmer really does involve knowing what's going on. It's, it's not about writing a few lines of PHP code and then you have absolutely no idea what's going to happen, right? Like it goes through tons of layers of code that you didn't write. You have no idea what they're doing. You know, maybe there's bugs in them. Maybe there's security holes. Oh my God, it's slow. Why is it slow? We have no idea. All of that stuff, I find it very limiting and frustrating. And so contrary to what people say about it being tedious or taking too long to program, I actually find that I'm very fast when I program in C. And I don't really find that there's that much of a value in using those high level languages unless literally all you wanted to do was pipe a few libraries together and have them do something, which admittedly is what a lot of people do in some of those languages. And that's fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. But when I'm actually getting down to business and I want to write some serious code that does some cool stuff, I don't want that stuff in my way. I want to know what's going on everywhere. So. Hopefully that has given you a little bit of taste of the assembly language and next session, what we're going to do is we're going to really dive into that and see exactly what all those things mean. I will explain binary and hexadecimal in a little more detail so you can understand it. I will also explain two's complement, which is how you do negative numbers. And then we'll look at this assembly again and hopefully it will be very clear to you at that time what's going on. And from then on, I will always refer back to the assembly just briefly whenever I show you something new so that you never have to be worried about it ever again. You'll just be used to it. It'll just be there. And you, even if you never learn to write a single line of code in assembly, that's totally fine. You will still always be empowered to know exactly what the CPU is doing whenever it's executing code on your behalf. 
And with that, I think I have probably pushed a little too much for one episode. Uh, so I am going to stop there. I'm going to stop the recording and then I will read uh, the Twitch chat starting now. So if you have questions you would like me to cover, please go ahead and put them there uh, and I will cover them. Thank you very much for joining me for this and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow and in the Q&A right after this if you are sticking around.